As in Vietnam, the rebels, American rebels in, uh, in America fought a total war, whereas the metropolitan power, the defender, Great Britain, fought a limited war. The rebels were gambling everything, including their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor, whereas the British, this was just another war overseas. For us, it was home. Uh, the Americans had a superior strategy in the long run. The first plank of that strategy, and it took George Washington a little bit to learn this, he had to learn it the hard way in and around New York, was that you're not going to stand up toe-to-toe -to -toe with a superior enemy, uh, a superior firepower in numbers, that you need to revert to a protracted war strategy in order to wear down the enemy's political will. And secondly, uh, in order to offset as much as possible the Americans' material inferiority, uh, the second part of the strategy was to search for external assistance, and of course the primary target was France. And in fact, uh, the way it ended up, the French do intervene uh, in 1778, uh, um, form an alliance with the United States. Uh, and provide enormous quantities of financial assistance and so on. And I'll get into some of those numbers here, but the bottom line is I don't see how you get to Yorktown without French assistance. As much as it is impolitic to speak well of the French these days, they were pretty damn important uh, back during the Revolutionary period. The British uh, didn't seem to really have a strategy other than seizing cities like New York and Philadelphia in the hope that Washington would come out and fight uh, peak uh, British strength in the colonies uh, during this period was 35,000, a woefully insufficient number to control uh, colonial America. Uh, they could do a little more than hold selected ports and make occasional forays uh, into the hostile American interior. And in fact, the British were unprepared to cope with the combination of a regular conventional army in the form of the Continental Army and an irregular threat in the form of colonial militias. Very, very difficult to defend against that combination of threats. Nor did it help that the Americans had no center of gravity. Um, there, was just no, there was nothing that the British could take and hold that would really uh, uh, decide the war. Uh, and they couldn't take, when they took Philadelphia, Congress and the government simply moved into the interior. Um, just in terms of some numbers here, the French supplied during the war uh, enormous amounts of, of equipment, including 30,000 muskets, uh, 300,000 pounds of gunpowder, 25,000 uniforms, and so on. But more important was with the formal establishment of an alliance between the United States and France came uh, uh, a French army under Comte de Rochambeau uh, here in the United States, uh, and also a French fleet uh, de Grasse's fleet, uh, which bottled up the uh, British at, at Yorktown. Uh, once the British got into this war, uh, once the French got into this war, uh, for the Britain, the United States became a sideshow. Uh, the French entry into the war transformed the uh, war into a global struggle between France and Great Britain, uh, fought in Europe and elsewhere, and the colonies immediately became, for the British, a, a secondary theater and one that they simply could not afford to put uh, most of their resources uh, in. So the bottom line is, is that uh, uh, the French uh, forces at Yorktown actually far outnumbered the American forces. So this was, I, I don't want to take away anything from uh, the, the, the quality of, of George Washington and the other rebel leadership, but it's hard to see how you get to the outcome that you do, certainly by 1781, without massive uh, external, in this case, French intervention. Now, going back to a, a different, uh, an opposite uh, vehicle, uh, another insurgency called the Confederacy, uh, and I'll treat that as an insurgency. Um, this was an insurgency that failed, and I would be prepared to argue in large measure, uh, because it failed to achieve the kind of, of external system that might have prevented it, permitted it to, to win. Um, in 1861, uh, the North had uh, a huge material advantages, uh, advantages that grew over time. 1861, uh, they had an 8 to 1 advantage in draftable manpower, a 6 to 1 advantage in financial resources and industrial production, a 4 to 1 advantage in railroad track mileage, and an overwhelming superiority in commercial maritime and naval power, 
including a latent capacity to gain control of the waterways that bounded and crisscrossed the Confederacy. <coughs> so, from a material standpoint, the the Confederacy was was uh, heavily overwhelmed. It was facing an enemy with vastly superior material resources. Um, <coughs> you look at the um, at the operational level of the war, which all too many historians do, and that's 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 fine. I, I love the operational arm of the war, but but in the final analysis. There was no way that the operational brilliance of Lee and Jackson and Longstreet and so on could offset the crushing material inferiority of the North as long as Abraham Lincoln, the great politi political genius of that war, could hold the North together politically. It was simply a question of time, uh, absent any kind of external assistance, uh, that the Confederacy was, was going to fall. By fighting the Union on its own terms, again, waging war on the Union's terms, even though the Union had a great material superiority. You pitted, uh, Confederates essentially pitted their weakness against the conventional military strength, superiority of the Union. Um, if this analysis is correct, then the South really had only two hopes for victory. To reduce the unfavorable material odds by a foreign intervention, or failing that to adopt an indirect strategy of guerrilla warfare, a strategy for which there was ample precedent in the Spanish Korea of, of uh, 1808 to 1814 against the French occupation in Spain. Unfortunately, prospects for foreign help in the form of British and French diplomatic recognition were problematic from the beginning. By the late summer of 1862, the French Emperor Napoleon III had favored recognition, but only in Britain would follow suit. But Lord Palmerston, uh, who was running the British government, uh, finally decided that he would not uh, he would not intervene, he would not grant recognition uh, to the South, and with that recognition, of course, would have come access to, to British financial credits and, and arms. Um, I want to conclude by saying that the American War of Independence and Civil War, I looked at a lot of insurgency, I just threw these two out here today to juxtapose them one against the other, um, are, are hardly conclusive proof of the vitality of external assistance. I mean, I, I think insurgent victories generally are delivered through a variety of vehicles. The insurgent, the victorious insurgent, usually has a stronger political will, usually has a better strategy, and usually has some modicum of external assistance. That's usually an, an, an insurgent victory can be explained through a combination of these factors, not through uh, simply uh, one factor or, or the other. Um, let me say uh, and close by uh, saying that external assistance, I think, is the most common enabler of insurgent success. Even if you get it, however, it's no guarantee that you're going to win. If you have a, a credit strategy and an a, 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 a inferior political will, you're not going to win regardless of how much you get. Um, let me suggest, in closing, uh, with respect to our 10-year and counting war in Afghanistan, uh, as in Vietnam, we find ourselves in an increasingly unpopular war on behalf of a corrupt and incompetent client regime facing tenacious inter and, and a, a tenacious insurgency that has access to substantial external assistance. As in Vietnam, we are trying to train and equip indigenous armed forces in the hope that they will fight effectively once we leave the country. Worse than in Vietnam, however, is the presence of an ostensible ally, the failing state of Pakistan which has long provided aid and comfort to the insurgency and whose inability or unwillingness to control its border with Afghanistan provides shelter for the insurgency. And with that, I will be still. Okay, well, thank you very much for that. Uh, well, some of you saw me last night. My name is uh, David Bucco. I'm an assistant professor at the College of International Security, professor at the National Defense University. Uh, I am uh, honored to sit here with uh, Jeffrey Reckitt, a man whose uh, scholarship I consulted frequently during my own uh, doctoral studies and thereafter. And I think that uh, there's a great point uh, to, to uh, his comments and to his paper, which is that behind every great insurgency movement uh, stands a great state. Perhaps not such a great state, but a state nonetheless. Um, one thing that I really like about the paper, which uh, uh, was kind of, kind of shared with me before this conference, is that uh, it's not overly categorical. I think there's a tendency in, in, in studies of counterinsurgency and insurgency to try to be the 
The next one to solve this riddle, to come up with something that absolutely devastates everything that's been said beforehand, uh, and to uh, find a silver bullet to this very difficult uh, problem. So we get talk of uh, you know the population centric or enemy centric or leader centric or culture centric. A lot of the different sort of totalizing answers to how uncertainties across the world can be defeated or understood. So I think, but I think that the uh, even though it's it's expressed in refreshing as a modest terms, uh, I think this is an ex extremely important point that's been brought out here. Which is that you know the state is, is still uh, in business, and the state still accounts for many of the difficulties that we see around the world, even though that its manifest expression tends to be one of non-state uh, and take non-state forms. And in, in a sense, uh, that this uh, what I like about this point is that we combat some of the hysteria that we've seen, uh, particularly since the Cold War, about non-state armed groups. Uh, since the Cold War, we have this idea of empowered non-state armed groups, whether they be criminal or terrorist or so in, in nature. Uh, we speak of the retreat of the state in favor of uh, increasing anarchy, insurgency, terrorism, and so on. And of course, there's ample evidence for all these things, but I think it is very much worthwhile to take a long historical perspective on some of these things. Uh, and I could only commend a, a brief article by a gentleman whom I never had the pleasure of meeting, but P. Michael Phillips wrote in Parameters an article called Deconstructing Our Dark Age Future. Um, what he does is uh, he, he basically makes a case that uh, the uh, uh, non-state armed group threat is greatly oversold, uh, or at least that it's always been with us, uh, and has always tended to reflect state politics. So uh, the, the quotation, which I think is central from his uh, piece, is that the system of Westphalian states is not in decline, it never existed beyond the utopian allegory exemplifying the American experience. And uh, what I believe he means by that is that we look back at 1648, this Westphalian treaty uh, between Münster and Osnabrück as uh, having some sort of magical gate into a, a system of international relations dominated by states that all of a sudden collapsed at the end of the Cold War. Uh, it's a grossly historical understanding of international relations but one unfortunately fueled by the very discipline named after this area of studies, international relations, capital I, capital R, with its theories of state centricity dominating during the Cold War and uh, its failure, I think, to understand international affairs and its full complexity. So uh, these sort of sweeping assertions, both about the Westphalian order, but also about the idea of new wars having all of a sudden come, into, come to the fore following the Cold War, it's, it's, uh, well, it just doesn't leave analysts in a very good place, and I think it accounts for some of the uh, somewhat uh, empirically unsustainable assertions made about insurgency since uh, 1990. Um, states have always had to assert control over the territory and ensure popular consent or acquiescence with their rule. Uh, some confront, confront great threats to phenomena, and uh, I think uh, we need to look at non-state actors very much with that backdrop, which uh, I think the, the, the paper that's just presented helps us do just that. Now, this is related to my comments, and really what I want to do is sort of look at the other side of the coin, uh, and really by that, that there's no pun intended. Uh, I want to look at why counterinsurgents fail. Uh, and, and I think the first point to bring out, which was already brought out uh, in uh, Professor Reckick's comments, is uh, do, do counterinsurgents always fail? Uh, we, we, we agonize over the cases that cause us the most trouble with. The cases that cause us the most trouble are, of course, also the ones uh, where we're uh, having the most difficulties. There are many other cases, however, I guess something you could call them the, the dogs that didn't bark, uh, that where, where basically we've, we've overcome insurgency movements with not great ease, but certainly hasn't made as many headlines. Uh, if you think about the uh, incidents worldwide of uh, social movements turning to violence as a means of like, achieving political change, few are in fact successful in that endeavor. And those are the ones, of course, that the ones we know about. The rest are understudied. And what we end up with is a very skewed case selection. I mean, you have, don't have to look any further than the anarchists of the 19th century, in the KKK, uh, the terrorist organizations in the 1960s, uh, the Alte Armee Fraktion, the Weather Underground, Black Panthers, uh, later movements such as Amshin Rikyo, etc. I mean, the list goes on and on. Now, all of these movements may have managed to launch a terrorist attack or two in their brief uh, existence. But they didn't really do much more than that. They didn't cross the threshold into a full-fledged insurgency, either because they didn't have the ideological 
action or they didn't have the leadership or there's many different reasons. But the point remains that not all non-state armed groups are as dangerous as we make them out to be. Uh, and in fact, many of them are not uh, such a big threat at all. Uh, in fact, it's worthwhile consulting the uh, START, uh, the uh, National Consortium for the Study of Terrorism and Responses to Terrorism. Uh, they have a database or a data set of uh, various terrorists in certain conflicts from, uh, I believe, 1970, but I probably have that wrong. Uh, and from their calculations, uh, they make the assertions that 45% of terrorist groups last less than a year. That's 45% last less than one year, and another 15% last between one and five years. So 60% of terrorist groups across time and space since their data uh, gathering began uh, are with us only for five years. Uh, I think that puts this conversation to some context. Uh, even if we just limit our conversation to insurgencies, full-fledged insurgencies that have already managed to sustain or attract a substantial amount of followers, there's obviously agreements propelling them forward, and we have this, uh, you know, the wicked problems of some like to talk about. Well, even just with that narrow data set, we still have Malayan communists who didn't make it, Greek communists who didn't make it, Filipino hooks, Nicaraguan Contras, Che Guevara in Bolivia, the Burs in South Africa, and twice, uh, Savimbi in Angola, Sandero Luminoso in Peru, RUF in Sierra Leone, FMLN in El Salvador, M19 in Colombia, and yesterday I had a very fascinating conversation at a dinner uh, which, in which we mentioned the French, well, Aaron Simpson um, enlightened me as to the French victories in Madagascar, and Cameroon. So the list goes on. Uh, why do we not talk about these as much as Iraq, Afghanistan, and the others? Well, for the obvious reasons that Iraq and Afghanistan and the others are the ones we have the most problems with. So looking at just this, the difficult ones, maybe we should rephrase the question. Uh, why do this counterinsurgency not work in these specific cases? And of course then, you're still confronted with a mass of different reasons. It's very difficult to say in general terms. But uh, we can look, for example, at legitimacy, the capacity, uh, the legitimacy of the kind of certain the capacity, their ability to address grievances, uh, and of course this issue of insurgents' external support, which I, I think is critical. Uh, I'd like to focus the rest of my comments just on one factor, which I think is um, also critical, uh, and that is the poor, the poor preparedness and performance of respective counterinsurgency forces. And uh, under that one main theme, can derive three rubrics. Um, first of all, uh, I think it's important to emphasize that the most tricky counterinsurgencies are the ones which are, of course, third party counterinsurgencies. And again, here I have to uh, defer to Aaron Simpson, who has done a lot of work on this. But third party conflicts require an intervening government to go into a foreign country and basically complement or, at worst, su supplant the host nation government. Uh, this is basically what we saw in Iraq following regime change, and this is what we have been trying to do in Afghanistan. Yet the problem is that Western governments are simply unprepared for these types of expeditionary endeavors. We're, we're just not colonial powers anymore. Counterinsurgency, of course, came to us in the mid 20th century, and I suggest to you that the speech of environment has changed quite uh, fundamentally since then. At this point, few government agencies are truly expeditionary or operational in an expeditionary sense. And those that are have great problems operating in conflict environments. So what we notice very quickly when we try to do these things is that we have these yawning capability gaps that we need to address. We're looking for some sort of colonial infrastructure and the ability to harmonize military and civilian actions in the field. So what do we do? Okay, we don't have that. We'll come up with something else. PRTs. Uh, that seems to work. That puts civilians and military personnel on the ground in a harmonized way. And of course, the PRTs have done a lot of good work, and I don't mean to denigrate their efforts, but they're a pale shadow, even of the program on which they're based, the uh, Civil Operations and Rural Development Support program from Vietnam. Um, Richard Stewart at the Center of Military History has some interesting statistics to this effect. You have more than 8,000 US soldiers and civilians committed to the course program. And if you count out all of the Vietnamese elements involved in pacification, and this not including the regular armed forces, uh, the number of personnel involved, namely uh, 850,000 uh, people. By contrast, the entire PRT effort in Afghanistan uh, amounts to around 3,000 personnel. So we've gone from 850,000 to 3,000. So you can see already how the PRT, while I'm sure they do a lot of good work, are again a pale shadow of the types of structures that we need. 
and quartz in and of itself really pales in comparison to the colonial type infrastructure that the British had at their disposal in, say, Malaya, which, of course, is a cardinal counter insurgency success story. Uh, in Malaya, what you had was a basically host nation civil service that operated within this part of the world for, uh, for centuries, a part of empire, and therefore had been able to penetrate the host nation society quite effectively. Now, on that topic, the idea of cultural penetration, uh, this is another thing that we find very difficult, the ability to determine the legitimate power holders uh, in the community and through them to address the interests and grievances of the population to represent. So how do we go about finding some equivalent to what we're able to, what's able to do? Well, let me look at something like human terrain teams, uh, which again, I'm no doubt have they been successful in this many testimonies of brigade and uh, battalion commanders as to their uh, helpfulness. But again, much like if ERTs, HTTs also face a dangerous improvisation. First of all, we only realize we need these things after a few years in conflict. So there are almost inevitably late comes to the field. And then, of course, as in most improvised efforts, there's issues of funding, training, and so forth, limited capacity. And because these are ad hoc fixes to a problem, then the other question is, how, what do these organizations become when the war is over? What's going to happen to HTTs after a potential war and uh, withdrawal from Afghanistan? And where does that leave us with the next conflict? Basically, we don't invest on a government level on the instruments that are required for sustained expeditionary action in weak, failing, or what you want states. Um, so this brings us to the second problem, beyond government uh, unpreparedness, the military. Uh, given that there's lack of government-wide capacity and capability for counterinsurgency, the military ends up doing most of the heavy lifting. We all know that. Uh, the problem, of course, is that this foists onto the military a bunch of tasks that they'd rather not do. And I'm not just talking about the civilian or non-military tasks, but also just the, uh, the requirements and uh, the skill sets needed for counterinsurgency operations. Uh, it seems to be that despite repeated experiences with insurgents, guerrillas, rebels, militias, partisans, tribes, and other non-state actors, the military in the US, but also in large parts of the Western world, uh, tends to treat these things as aberrational. And we have this cultural predisposition towards uh, what we call conventional or traditional or major wars. Uh, the problem, and I think I made a comment on this yesterday, so uh, I hope you bear with me if I repeat myself slightly, is that every time we confront these challenges of non-state armed groups, <coughs> we treat it as, uh, as optional or exceptional, so that you know you have these dichotomies between limited and general war, between low intensity and high intensity conflict, between regular or irregular war, and so on and so forth. It leads to a very reductionist understanding of war. Uh, and, and, and these dichotomies, uh, while they're initially helpful in framing a, a different mindset in our approach to insurgency, uh, the end result tends to be that we encourage an idea that you can fight either irregular or regular wars. So you have a choice of choosing between high intensity and low intensity. That the, the, theoretical dichotomy that we operate by actually has a rarefied equivalent uh, out in practice. Uh, and of course, if you adhere to that belief, either subconsciously or, 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 or uh, outright, it makes sense then to choose to do the easier of the two, or the ones that you're culturally and institutional prepared for. What tends to happen, therefore, is we pick up uh, the whole jargon, the whole terminology, about irregular warfare, counterinsurgency, insurgency, whilst we're in the midst of such a conflict. But once we're given a choice, again, or an apparent choice, we revert to the status quo ante and look at what we know best. Um, missed here is an appreciation of the war as a complex political phenomenon, uh, one that typically encompasses both regular and conventional challenges, and its operating environment is very static, and is very difficult to control. Now, I think to the extent that the military is struggling with this cultural uh, <laughs> problem, there's really two apparent solutions. One is to get the military to embrace the missions that are so far treated as aberrational, and this has been the topic of my research. I've been looking at the US military in particular, but also now including a book on the British military and counterinsurgency to look at some of the institutional adaptation that has occurred in recent years. And uh, I don't want to bore you too much with that, but I think it's a sort of main finding, it looks unlikely to me that counterinsurgency will be accepted uh, as it 
appear equivalent to major combat operations. Some of you may recall the 2005 directive coming out of the Office of the, the uh, Secretary of Defense saying that DOD also treats stability operations on the same level of importance as uh, major combat operations. Uh, I think that directive was uh, subsequently demoted to a DOD instruction, and I don't think that it has much pull, and it will not have much pull after the uh, drawdown from Afghanistan. So I think a more um, likely, or perhaps a more promising route, is basically to, to think of, uh, to rethink our understanding of war in itself, to drop some of the jargon and terminology that the recent campaigns have given rise to, and just to think about the requirements for the effective use of force in today's and tomorrow's likely campaigns. Uh, John uh, Keasley, who was the, uh, or General John Keasley, who's the uh, former head of the British Defence Academy, uh, I think summarizes some of these requirements quite effectively in his monograph on uh, postmodern challenges to the modern soldier, or something to that effect. Uh, and uh, if you allow me, I just want to swiftly read through his sort of list of the types of skill sets and requirements that are needed, not just in counter insurgency, but really by all land forces operating in an expeditionary complex environment. He talks of the ability to apply soft power as well as hard, hard work in partnership with multinational, multi agency organizations, civilian as well as military, master information operations and engage successfully with the media, conduct persuasive dialogue with local leaders, mentally outmaneuver a wily and ruthless enemy, and pass oneself in overlooked, measure progress appropriately. Uh, he continues to suggest that these competences, uh, competencies will require a high level of understanding of the political context, the legal, moral, and ethical complexities, culture and religion, how societies work, what constitutes good governance, the relationship between one's own armed forces and society, the notion of human security, the concept of legitimacy, the limitations on the utility of force, the psychology of one's opponent, and the rest of the population. Now, I'm not denying that instilling those types of attributes in a modern soldier is going to be extremely challenging. But I think that uh, we would be better served if we treat those skills as ideal, really across the spectrum, rather than something allocated and monopolized by a very narrow field of counterinsurgency. Brings me to the third and final, and I think most fundamental shortcoming in, in the counterinsurgencies that we've seen, or the, the reason why counterinsurgency remains so difficult in so many theaters which is the strategic weakness that we're struggling with, uh, or really strategic ineptitude, if I, if I uh, may be slightly provocative. Even with a broader understanding of war on the part of our soldiers, even with right governmental uh, instruments to operate with, I think the deployment of armed forces will inevitably lead to disappointment unless intervening governments devote far more energy and resources towards a formulation of strategy. Uh, this, of course, touches upon the seriousness and sincerity with which the states that engage in expeditionary operations uh, approach these very endeavors. It raises the question of whether or not uh, uh, foreign military interventions like the ones we see in Afghanistan and Iraq are in fact linked to the national interest of the states involved. How serious are we in fact about getting this right? Uh, and now I'm not going to start peddling a bunch of sort of stab in the back theories here, but I do think that there's a problem in formulation of strategy or understanding what strategy actually is that flows down and complicates all operations from policy level down. Elliot Cohen, I think, does a great job at summarizing what strategy is all about, and I think it really poses a challenge very starkly for us. He defines strategy as the art of choice that binds means with objectives. It is the highest level of thinking about war and involves priorities. We will devote resources here, even if it means starting operations there. Sequencing, we will do this first, then that, and a theory of victory, we will succeed for the following reasons. Now, if you look upon that as the ideal on the one hand, if you look at what we went into Iraq and Afghanistan with, perhaps the question shouldn't be why are counterinsurgency so difficult, but why on earth did we go into these campaigns with the assumptions and preconceptions that we had at hand at the time? And this is not a matter of 2020 hindsight. I think anyone, anyone with a keen sense of history would have been able to predict some of the difficulties facing both campaigns, and many people did. So the question really is why those concerns, why those uh, reservations were not felt, and why they didn't in, in, uh, inform policy making uh, at that time. Uh, to end on a real downer, but on a provocative note, that I think might prompt the help of discussion, I'm just going to cite to Arthur Schlesinger's comment in 2006. Uh, Sometimes when I'm particularly depressed, I strive our behavior to stupidity. The stupidity of our leadership, the stupidity of our culture. Thirty years ago, we suffered military defeat, fighting an unwinnable war against a country about which we knew nothing and in which we had no vital interest at stake. 
Vietnam was bad enough, but to repeat the same experiment 30 years later in Iraq is a strong argument for a case of national stupidity. I think there are bright sides, and I think that we managed to clench uh, uh, some sort of victory from the jaws of defeat in Iraq through the implementation of a strategy that was adaptable, informed, more resourced, uh, and realistic. But then you look at Afghanistan and you wonder how much we learn from that experience. Uh, this, I think, these three reasons, the lack of government instruments, the military's orthodoxy, and the lack of strategic uh, clarity of mind, are three fundamental reasons why third party intervention and insurgency and counter insurgency. I, I'm uh, pretty much in, in, in agreement uh, with, with my colleague. Uh, I, I have very strong reservations about the ability of any Western uh, forced to go into a non-Western society and remake it uh, in, in a satisfactory fashion. Um, the fact that we did that in Japan after World War II is an exception that proves the rule. We had enormous advantages in Japan that we've not had since. Um, again, we get back to this question of, of you know, in, in the end, it makes no difference how good you are operationally, and that's important. If, if, if the strategy is wrong, you're not going to be redeeming a, a bad strategy. With, 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 with great operations. This country has made three strategic blunders since 1945. Crossing the 38th parallel in Korea in 1951 and provoking a, an unwanted war with China. Committing uh, to Vietnam uh, in 1965 and invading Iraq uh, in, in 2003. And behind every one of those were self-serving assumptions and a lot of wishful thinking and an enormous amount of cultural ignorance about the area, the places that we were going, and the uh, uh, history of, of, of our enemies. The recent book um, on McGeorge Bundy by Ronald Goldstein, uh, he says in the book that at no time during his many, many interviews with McGeorge Bundy, who was National Security Advisor to Kennedy and Johnson, did McGeorge Bundy ever express an interest in the Vietnamese communists and the history of Vietnam or in the French Indo-Chinese War. It, it's as if, you know, they were completely irrelevant. And that's the kind of, of, that's the kind of mindset that drove us into, uh, into Iraq. No, I mean, Britain was fighting for its very existence. Exactly. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't see any existential uh, issue here in, a, in Iraq or Afghanistan. And, and I think, you know, the point that, that Gil Merrim, the Israeli scholar, was making in his book several years ago uh, based upon a lot of it, based upon Israeli experiences, is that modern democracies do not have the tolerance for the kind of brutal counterinsurgency methods that dictatorships use, and they have limited tolerance for wars that go on forever over stakes that don't appear to be critical, vital interests, and that therefore. Any democratic leader thinking of involving his country, uh, taking his country into one of these wars, ought to give a lot of cautious thought to the wisdom of this, how he's going to get out of it. And, and so I, I think the, the, the issue is not can we do coin once we're there. The issue is should we be doing coin in the first place? I mean, was, was coin thrust upon us in Vietnam? Was coin thrust upon us in, 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 in Iraq? We shouldn't have been in those countries in the first place. I'm, I'm sorry, we've got to be a lot more selective about where we make our, our bets overseas. Uh, and I haven't even spoken of the, of the last 10 years fiscal environment and the coming 10 or 20 years fiscal environment, where we are going to be compelled to make choices about force structure and about uh, selectivity with respect to using force overseas. Uh, I, 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 I'm not particularly persuaded that coin is the wave of the future. Uh, uh, it may be and it may not be. Most insurgencies take place in areas and in places that we don't really care that much about or that don't pose that much of a threat to us. Um, I, I share with my colleague here, I, I think that, that, that the coin guys are going to lose in the Army. I think the Army is going to, uh, they're, they're gonna, they don't want to think about Iraq and Afghanistan anymore once they get out of here. They want to go back to doing what, what, they, what their comfort zone tells them. Uh, it is, is easy to do, uh, and that's, that's major combat operations.